my name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Here in the North West, the words Fleetwood and Fish have for many years been synonymous. For anglers, it's because the port is the only venue with charter boat activity throughout the entire area, and for everyone else because the town was built on the commercial fishing industry. As the UK's one-time premier distant water port, trawlers returning from Iceland regularly queued up in the River Wire waiting for the tide to get into the fish dock, which now is a posh private boat marina. Then, in the mid-1970s, the Icelandic Cod Wars and NATO politics but paid to all of that, leaving the town a mere shadow of its former self. Ironically, though for different reasons, the angling side of things mirrored the commercial fishing in that after an almost meteoric rise to prominence, it too had the rug pulled from under it due to politics, in quite a sudden though equally devastating way. When I first fished from Fleetwood, it was either aboard Leadbetter's boats or bird sea fishing trips back in the late 1960s. Back then, no bookings were necessary. Just turn up, pile as many on board as would fit, then down to the end of the channel, fishing literally over other people's shoulders, and all for just a few flounders and dabs. Then, during the 1970s, ex-commercial fisherman Frank B. decided to apply his local knowledge to taking anglers out, and quite literally put both Fleetwood and Morecambe Bay on the sea angling map, with some tremendous catches of thornback rays. That was just the trigger that Fleetwood needed, and very quickly the port's charter fleet swelled to a dozen or more boats pulling in anglers from quite a sizeable catchment area, mainly at weekends throughout the entire year. But almost as rapidly as the angling interest had grown, it unfortunately nosedived into spectacular decline. Strangely enough, this had little if anything to do with the quality of the fishing, which had remained consistent throughout, which is still very much the case here today in 2013. Unfortunately, other forces were at work. To explore just exactly what these were, and to chart the dominance and decline of Fleetwood as a major charter angling destination, I'm joined by one of the charter skippers from those boom years, Keith Philbin, who owned and operated both Happy Hooker and Sarah Jane. Now when we first met back in the 1970s, you was part way through building a fishing dinghy in your garage from rolls of matting and barrels of resin. Building a boat from scratch, quite literally these days, is probably unheard of. But that's the way people did things back then. No, it was uh, shoestring fishing, I suppose, or shoestring boat fishing. I built mine myself with the help of a company called Glassbys in Southport. They had a selection of moulds you could borrow for free if you uh, bought the material. So obviously we borrowed a a mould, made my boat in the garage, made the trailer and uh, bought an engine and safety gear, and we're off. And the boat itself? The boat itself was a little 16-foot displacement hull, about 5-foot-6 beam, semi-sturdy, as you might say. Well, it was all right. I used that for quite a few years, in the late 70s, up to about 1980. Then I uh, had bigger ambitions. Yet despite the simplicity of the outfit, we still had some very good fish. There's some cracking fish. I towed that boat all over Lancashire, North West, Scotland. We had some really good fishing in those days. Excellent. That was my introduction both to the dinghy fishing and the Fowl Coast Cod, which coincidentally came right at the start of the famous Jumbo Cod Run, which you, me and Kevin Johnson were lucky enough to tap into. Kevin had a £21 cod in that boat. That was the biggest one I got. I never got the 30-pounder, but obviously I got numerous double-figured cod, numerous, together with all the single-figured ones and all the whiting and uh, everything else that went with it. It was excellent fishing, really. Excellent. That dinghy actually was the first happy hooker, the second coming along a few years later when again you applied your engineering and boat-building skills to putting together Happy Hooker 2, a brand-new 30-foot charter boat. Again, quite literally built by you virtually from scratch. Obviously I did it for the fishing, but I also did it for the experience of building it as well. I just set myself the task and thought I would uh, build one. I was friendly with a charter skipper from Fleetwood called Des White, who also had a a boat building company in Fleetwood. And he was the uh, agent for these versatility fishing boat holes. He had a 30-foot bare hole 
outside his workshop in Fleetwood and uh, he was going to make it into a charter boat for his son who was at the time about 16, a lad named Sean. But uh, shortly after that, versatility shut down and uh, Des went down to Rye in Sussex where they built the hulls and bought the complete set of moulds for building these boats from 25 foot, 30 foot and a 35 foot. But he also bought a part built 35 foot version at which time he said he was going to convert that to his son's boat and subsequently the 30 foot hull that he had in stock was up for sale and after a bit of deliberation I uh, decided to buy it so I bought that off Des White at Fleetwood and uh, had it transported to a little village called Tarleton a boatyard on the River Douglas where I set the hull up and uh, started to complete it. it took me two years to complete from scratch and uh, subsequently ended up with uh, what I decided was a charter boat. I bought the hull in 1981, late 80, what, 1981, started building it in 82 and finally sailed from the River Douglas down the River Ribble out into the Irish Sea and round to Fleetwood on, in 1984 and more or less immediately started charter fishing. But I had been out with um, Des White on his charter boat on quite a few occasions. But by the time I uh, I sailed my boat to Fleetwood, Des White had departed for Maryport in Cumbria, where he was going to start building his versatility boats from. The first time I saw that boat, it was under a large tarpaulin while you was putting in the deck. A far cry from building a dinghy in your garage, and a process most people interested in boats will never get to experience or even see. So give us a quick talk through the enormity of a job facing you. Yeah, I mean basically, the hull of the boat from Des White was literally a hull shape. No fittings in it, nothing, just a complete bare hull fiberglass. The wheelhouse was actually bought from Des White. He inherited a, a mould for the wheelhouse, but by that time he was uh, working out of Maryport, so I had to go up to Maryport to pick this wheelhouse up. So basically, I didn't make the hull and I didn't make the wheelhouse. The rest of it, as far as uh, frame fitting, deck fitting, engine, rudders, everything else, was done by myself. All the woodwork, gunnels, and rails, everything was completed by myself. I did the engine and the rudder and things like that in my garage, and then obviously shipped it down to the boatyard when it was ready for installation. And when you arrive at Fleetwood, there's no marina in those days waiting to put the boat into. It was still part of the old fish key way back then. So pickups from the beach using a ladder were the only way of boarding parties. My first mooring was actually on the river wire. On the river itself, there was four or five charter boats used to moor on the river on swinging moorings. I, uh, previous to sailing to Fleetwood, I had been up there, talked to one or two of the lads and laid a mooring in the river ready for my arrival. So when I sailed around to Fleetwood, I had the boat on a mooring in the river wire. Did that for a couple of years, then um, obviously talked to the lads. Um, there was a couple of charter boats worked out of the tidal Jubilee Quay, but the majority of them tended to be on the river to start with. And uh, spoke to the lads and started chartering uh, more or less straight away. All the lads were very helpful. They showed me marks, etc., etc., and uh, we built up a business from there. But after a couple of years, most of the charter boats decided to uh, moor in the Jubilee Quay as it was safer and uh, easier to get in and out. But we couldn't load the anglers on in the Jubilee Quay. We weren't allowed. So we had to um, sail from the Jubilee Quay on the tide and pick up on the beach at Fleetwood, which was uh, extremely difficult at times due to the fast tide run in the wire estuary there. But we managed and did it from there for quite a few years. We did approach the council for possible better facilities, i.e. ferry dock or whatever, but the ferry dock was obviously 
used by the ferry and the, and the people that had contracted the ferry, so they weren't too helpful on uh, letting us use the ferry dock. So for years we ended up on the beach. We did get the council down to look at the uh, the problems we had, but they more or less washed their hands of it and said, you'll have to carry on as you are. Plus the fact that the nautical college built a jetty on the beach that pinched what we classed as the best spot for picking up, so we had to move further down and put up with stronger tides. Everybody managed, but it was not the ideal way of uh, embarking your anglers. But that's what we had to put up with. We got no help at all from the council, so we persevered. And in many ways, nothing much has changed. I was fishing there last week and we still had to board by ladder, with the boat nose into the beach and the engine running in gear. When you're on the spring tide, you've virtually got your engine running at full tilt just to keep the boat from swinging round onto the beach. You're more or less flat out with your engine. And then uh, once you've got your anglers aboard, it was uh, quick astern and uh, hope it didn't wash you round onto the beach before your boat pulled away. It was uh, quite scary at times. Obviously, on odd occasions, boats did get stuck because they'd been on the beach. They'd nosed onto the beach on an ebb tide and the anglers took too long to get on and uh, we ended up situations where boats were trying to tow boats off the beach and things like that. I got stuck once, high and dry, and had to wait for the next tide. Generally we did manage, but at today's age, at health and safety and risk assessments, uh, it would have been a bit air and scare and, and probably wouldn't, in theory, be allowed. Although obviously the charter boats that do work from fleet would still do the same thing. I would imagine if their insurance companies found out how they were doing it, they might not insure them, I don't know. But nothing's changed. In common with pretty much all of the other angling boats at that time, your angling parties would mainly come at weekends. So what was it like as a new boy fitting in and putting extra pressure onto an already existing setup? When I first started, it was quite a good trade going. So really, it didn't affect any of the other boats too much, as there were there tended to be plenty of anglers about wanting to go out. You know, most boats were full Saturday, Sunday, week in, week out, and they sailed weather permitting. But um, the lads I worked with were, were fine. I joined them, and um, everybody got on really well. They accepted me no problem at all, and there was perhaps about eight of us used to moor in the key four deep. There were two rows, there were basically about eight of us tied up together, and uh, we all worked together. And some of the lads obviously worked uh, full time, so when we came in of a, of a weekend, if I was the outside boat, I knew by the following weekend I'd be the inside boat, because somebody would be going out and they moved me to the inside, so my boat used to take more hammer up and down the key than most of the others, but uh, no, they were fine, the lads, great. You couldn't fault them. Everybody helped each other if there was any problems. Same at sea. Somebody broke down and we towed them back. It was actually, in my opinion, a lot safer in those days than it is now because you had the numbers of boats out there and any problems could be sorted much easier than it is today when there's probably only one boat going out on their own all the time. No, it was great. All the lads were brilliant. Who were the skippers and boats back then? Can you remember? Of the eight, there was uh, two boats owned by one family, the Wandering Star and the Viking Two. They weren't owner skippers, they were just employed skippers on a neat basis. Peter Atkinson, he had the Harvester, and then Bob Kidd, he had the Aquila. There was the Princess Anne. Um, Liquidator. Liquidator, yeah. Roughly eight of us, basically. And obviously, um, the company that ran the ferry had two or three angling boats that worked out of the ferry dock. They didn't move up with us. So, in total, at its height, there was probably, I think there was one lifeboat competition. We uh, put 15 boats out that day. That was about the maximum it got to. But basically, there was about eight of us in the key work together. Then, obviously, there was three or four boats from the ferry dock and still a couple of boats on the river as well. So it was basically between 8 and 12 charter boats most of the time, and um, they all worked together really well. Quite a diverse range of boats really, as well as a collective foot in two camps. The older plodder and ex-ship's lifeboat era, and the early days of the bigger, faster planing hulls. 
Yeah, yeah, we had uh, two reasonably fast boats, a couple of ex-ships lifeboats. The rest of them just tend to be the uh, displacement, five or six knots, seven, eight knots boats. They were all quite good boats. They were all well suited. Most of them were quite well looked after, so they were uh, they were always reasonably well maintained. And obviously, we had to get um, the local council license every twelve months, which was a out of water survey and a on water survey, and. Uh, we tended to just beach the boats together and get the surveys done together. Spring time usually. So everybody was licensed and everything. So it was all right. Everything was grand. Everybody worked for each other. Quite a few tried working it full time, but they struggled. They definitely struggled. I mean, I remember one winter, we went 18 weeks and never got a Saturday or a Sunday in in 18 weeks. So I get paid 18 weeks insurance, 18 weeks mooring fees. I would have had to do three trips just to get that money back. You've obviously got the weather that doesn't help as well. You know, you can have a full diary, but it doesn't mean a lot at the end of the day. It doesn't mean pound notes. It's only pound notes when you're uh, heading back in and uh, taking the money, isn't it? It is a difficult thing to make a living at. A lot of tried and a lot of failed. And because of the local geography, despite Morecambe Bay and the Fowl Coast being west-facing, Fleetwood was a lot less susceptible to the weather than a lot of people might think. But to offset that, there were some problems on the bigger tides. Yeah, obviously spring tides were very bad really. You were a little limited to where you could fish comfortably. Um, probably the best places were uh, Russell and Cleveland's really, which didn't tend to produce a lot of fish during the summer, but did over the winter period. As far as the bay was concerned, the tides on spring tides, it was quite horrendous. We tended to fish fairly close to Fleetwood at the end of the uh, wire channel going up towards uh, the Glasgow Channel, Loon, River Loon, and up towards uh, Eysham Harbour. There were one or two spots in that direction that weren't too bad on the big tides. But on the slack tides, you could fish anywhere. That's when the main fishing took place. I mean, obviously... As far as the charter bookings were concerned, the neat tides were always booked up before the spring tides, apart from winter, when we used to stay more local to Fleetwood and fish, possibly weather permitting, Russell or Cleveland's for the cod, for which you need the uh, the spring tides, really. So, As far as wind goes, westerlies round to northerlies are not very good at Fleetwood, but southwesterlies to southerlies are not too bad. Fishing more local to Fleetwood as you as you tend to get shelter from the sandbanks on the lower tides. With being a shallow bay, Morecambe Bay was quite horrendous when there was a wind against tide, especially in the, in the Loon Deeps, which was a deep channel the main shipping uses out to sea. If you got wind against tide down the Loon Deeps, it was quite horrendous. On a fair breeze, you could get a six or eight foot swell down there, wind against tide, but go over the deep bit onto the shallow bit and it can be virtually flat calm. It's had its problems. A little bit of wind from some directions caused problems at times, but generally westerly to northerly wasn't good. Southwesterly to southerly was okay, not too bad. Let's talk now a little bit more about the rest of the fishing. Give us a guided tour of what could be expected back then on a seasonal basis over the year. Starting in January, you would still be fishing the whiting and the codling local if the weather wasn't too clever or, or Russell Cleveland's if the weather was good. But it was mainly a few flatties during January, but mainly whiting and the cod. But the cod used to tail off, say, end of January. February and March were the leanest months of the year, really. February and March, there was very little fish about. Come March, April, you used to get a few thornback skate showing in the bay and that's what we used to mainly fish for until sort of get to May time and then the, the flatties, the place and all the other summer species talk, your doggies and everything they used to show and then all the way through the summer we had a good selection of, of fish including all your flatties, thornbacks, talk, a few turbot, a few bass you know we had quite a good range of fish and then we got to the back end towards September the whiting fishing 
linked up with the last of the summer fishing and uh, and then obviously we went in back into the cod and the whiting for winter again. So we only had basically February and March were very lean months. The rest of the year you could probably expect to catch fish. Arguably, the main claim to fame at Fleetwood back then was the quality of its thornback ray fishing. If you recall, I was out with you the day when we brought the port record with 97 rays, which still stands now in 2013. What do you remember of that trip? Yeah, 97 skating, four and a half hours. And uh, I gave up after a couple of hours and left everybody to themselves out. But uh, yes, that was a good day. It was a live boat competition and uh, actually on the Saturday, the day before, we'd been out and, and really struggled for fish. We'd been all over the bay and we virtually just had a flat fish mainly. Uh, we hardly saw a skate on the Saturday, so the prospects for the Sunday, which was a competition in aid of the live boat, was poor. So we all set off and uh, I, I just headed for the spot. We'd done a few fish the day before, gave it a couple of hours very little so we decided to move so uh, I moved over towards the rest of the charter boats more in the middle of the bay I didn't want to go too near and, and disturb them or anything so we kept about half a mile away and uh, just dropped anchor and before the anchor settled uh, virtually everybody in the boat was was into fish and that went on for the next four and a half hours non-stop I think we landed about 64 skate anything under five pounds we always returned and I think we won 11 out of the 12 places in the, in the competition. We only lost out to one. But having said that, the other charter boats, they had 50, 60 throwing back seats. It was just one of those days where the whole bay must have just been carpeted in throwing back skate for some reason. But uh, yes, that was a day and a half, that. Definitely. As I've said, we took the record. But a couple of other boats also beat the existing record on the same day. Then shortly afterwards... Thornbacks everywhere in the country slipped into decline and remained at low population density for a good many years. More recently though, they have made something of a comeback, but not by all accounts to where we caught them then over the roofs around the edge of Morecambe Bay. That ground itself probably hasn't changed, but something somewhere has, with the rays not looking like ever coming back there at all. Any observations or comments on that one? I wouldn't really like to say there was always plenty of food on the ground for these fish. I don't know why they would move. There was always thornbacks off Liverpool, Southport-wise, and uh, the dinghies used to get them down there. I really haven't got a clue why they moved. It obviously must have been something to do with uh, the availability of food, but I can't really explain it all that well. One thing that sticks in my mind is that throughout the 1970s and 80s, when the smaller boats were getting the jumbo cod off Rossall, Despite the fact that charters came around to join in amongst them, they usually went back empty-handed in terms of big fish. So as someone who was a part of that, what are your observations regarding that particular situation? Well, the main thing was down to the anglers themselves, I think. You get people come in on charter boats and they come with the short rods straight down over the side. They didn't really develop the same methods of, as the dinghy men which obviously was uh, boat casting and fishing away from the boat was the best method of doing it. The charter anglers just tended to go straight down. And there was very few boat casters and, and things on the charter boat, so that was one reason. The other reason was obviously the anglers were, unless they ordered the bait off you, fetch their own bait, which probably wasn't as fresh or, or as suitable for big cod fishing. And obviously a bigger boat makes more noise at the end of the day, so... If they're fishing straight down over the boat and the boat's making more noise, that obviously could affect the situation a lot. But I, I have fished on my charter boat and caught bigger cod on my own by boat casting. It is possible, but the general run of angler that frequents a charter boat doesn't have the right tackle to start with and, and the right bait normally. So it, it was a little bit down to the anglers and possibly a little bit down to the fact that that your boat was a little bit noisier in the water. Plus we're only fishing in, well, low tide, you were down to 15 foot of water or you might be in 30 foot of water, which is quite shallow really. But uh, I think it was down to the methods of the anglers mainly and the bait situation, not knowing exactly how to fish for them. I mean, obviously these dinghy anglers are out more often and they've developed their styles and found out how to catch these fish. 
charter anglers don't necessarily uh, have that experience. Lack of patience was possibly another factor. Big cod, in fact quite often cod generally, were not exactly thick on the ground back then, despite what's often said, so you had to be prepared to put in the time, which charter anglers, having paid a fee, are often less inclined to do. Yeah, that's quite true, yeah. I mean, anglers want to try and catch fish of any description, really. They want to go on catching fish, so charter boats do tend to move possibly uh, a little bit more than uh, than the dinghy lads did. They were quite willing to uh, sit it out and wait, but sometimes charter anglers are a bit impatient and quite often ask the skipper for a move. Although the skipper wants to stop and persevere, there's 12 anglers on a boat, and if you're only going to catch one ten pound cod or one twelve pound cod between twelve anglers there's only one angler going to succeed so they do tend to ask for moves more often but that's the way they are they're paying for the trip so if they want to move you move that will be another small part of it but not to my mind the major part but it is patience at the end of the day fishing one other incident that sticks in my mind is a particular january afternoon on the way back into rossell church with the dinghy when I got a radio request from Lender Hander skipper Des White, who must have been listening in on the VHF, asking us to show his anglers a £30 cob we had on board, just to prove that he was putting his party over good fish. Later that evening at home, I also got a telephone call from Des asking about a trip. So on the next set of big tides we took him out, and Steve managed to catch another jumbo marginally over 30. But despite later fishing the same tactics, he still couldn't put a big cod in his boat, and everyone else's parties couldn't seem to catch them either. Well, it was difficult, I must admit. The biggest cod I had on my boat were actually 17, but it wasn't caught at Russell or Cleavers, it was caught uh, close to Fleetwood on a dab up with a whiting on. It was more of a lucky catch, that. But if round at Russell, we did, we did catch codlings, but we never had any of the really big ones. I think I had a couple of double figure ones on my charter boat, but that was very few and far between obviously but I still say it was down to the anglers a bit I mean Des White wanted to know how to fish him obviously Des White knew how to fish once it once he'd been out with you but you've still got to portray that to your anglers and you've got to get your anglers fishing right I mean if you watch 12 anglers get on a charter boat with their fishing gear and you watch a dinghy setting off from Blackpool you will see a complete and absolute totally different tattle so it would have been a quite a long period of time trying to persuade these anglers that they had to fish totally different because charter fishing anglers didn't come fishing as often as, as the dinghy anglers went out they probably didn't want to uh, invest too much in different tackle i think it would be possible to catch some of these cod from a charter boat but it would be dedicated anglers that would probably do it and not your normal run-of-the-mill charter anglers. You could teach them how to do it, but you can't, you can't give them fish. You could only try. And as I say, the majority of the anglers didn't fish to me the right way and, and weren't willing to change and obviously give it the right length of time and be patient. I think it was possible to an extent to probably get one or two fish, but not without changing the way the charter anglers fish. Now the fishing we've talked about went on for quite a few years and there seemed to be no shortage of people wanting to keep all the charter boats full. Then suddenly it nose dived into decline. Suggestions as to the reasons why include the unemployment of the Thatcher years and prioritising spending. Then, after the recession was over, people it seemed simply neglected to come back into fishing. Yeah, that's true to an extent, but I think you've missed the major problem out. The change from a local licence to a Department of Trade licence, when you had to have a surveyor coming from Liverpool at £70 an hour, which was a lot of money in those days, to do a survey in the water and out of the water, and ending up with a bill of quite a few hundred pounds for the survey, plus obviously there will be extra gear involved because it was stepping up from a local council licence to a Department of Trade licence, there was life rafts involved, whereas before you only had buoyancy rafts, things like that. But the actual cost of the survey went from £35 for a local licence to hundreds and hundreds of pounds for a Department of Trade licence, which means during, like you say, during a recession, when you're, you're obviously not getting as many anglers, the whole thing at the end of the day collapsed mainly because it didn't pay. 
You couldn't actually charge silly prices at Fleetwood. Traditionally, it's been one of the cheapest charter areas. Fleetwood, North Wales, was the cheapest charter area in the country, basically. So on tradition, you couldn't demand big prices for your fishing. There was a decline in the number of anglers, plus the big change in licensing was the main reason that, that a lot of the lads packed up and gave up chartering. It wasn't purely because there was no anglers, it was purely because of the cost of keeping the boat afloat, basically. So is Margaret Thatcher blameless in all of this then? As I say, it wasn't the biggest factor, but it was a significant factor. Obviously, if, if there's a recession, money's tight, you give up the things that are easiest first, which are your sports, your fishing, anything along that line, obviously uh, gets it first. So obviously there was a decline in anglers, together with the change in licensing. So the, the cost of licensing was rocketing, and, and the number of anglers was obviously going down, although it was under a council licence, it, it was probably still viable. It was mainly to do with the licensing more than the anglers, although the anglers were decreasing at the time. If ever you decided to go back into fishing, you'd most certainly find the Fleetwood of today a very different port to the one that you last worked out of. Marina Bay's boats still have to drop out into the river at all hours of the night, then pick up by a ladder from the beach. But it's the fishing itself that's so very different now, some of which we chatted about before turning the voice recorder on. When I was dinghy fishing, there was plenty of place fishing, because we could obviously trail with boats and go further afield over Barraway, Walney Island, there, there was some good place fishing over there. Obviously, from a charter point of view, we had a long sail, so we didn't always chase that in that direction. But locally to Fleetwood, it was mainly dams who were catching in way flatties, not the place. Place were a bit more few and far between. All right, things change. If there's more place fishing now, there's no skate fishing. So obviously, there's more place fishing, so it just swings and roundabouts. You, you, as long as you're still catching fish, things change. If you can get place closer to Fleetwood, obviously it's for the better because you don't have to sail as far. And in this day and age of expensive fuel, obviously if the charter skipper doesn't have to sail as far for fish, then it's obviously going to be a big advantage to him as well. Charter clients these days now have access to bass around the loon, small cod and whiting in the winter off Rossell, place in the wire all summer long, and lots and lots of taupe off the south end of Walney. But arguably the biggest boom, and one which you probably never witnessed, is the recent invasion of smooth hounds in around Cleveleys. Plenty of them too early summer, with some quite good ones mixed in amongst them. When I was charter fishing, there was no such thing as a smooth hound. Only thing we got were the tall and the lesser spotted doggies. We didn't get any bullos and we didn't get any smooth hounds, so obviously things have changed. Probably for the better for him if he can specialise and, and, and get trips to, to specialise in these species. I mean, I used to get people on, on trips who wanted to go specialising for taupe, but fishing for taupe with 12 anglers on a boat is not easy. It tends to be quite difficult with all the lines in the water and everything. It's not easy to fish for taupe with 12 anglers, so we didn't tend to do that a lot. Although I must admit, I did have the uh, Northwest taupe record, and uh, as far as I know, it, it's still held to this day, but we didn't tend to fish specifically for taupe unless smaller groups of anglers book the whole boat and fish maybe only four or five or six anglers instead of the twelve. But it definitely has changed. I mean, I haven't charted out of Fleetwood for a year or two now, so I'm only being told what the changes are. But uh, if it's changing, it's changing. That's what everything does. And uh, if the fish are near a Fleetwood, all the better for the charter skippers. Less travelling time, more fishing time. Because we used to fish the bay, sometimes we, we would travel for an hour and a half. So out of an eight-hour charter trip, you're an hour and a half out, a little bit of moving round, and an hour and a half back. So you may only, in theory, get four hours fishing for an eight-hour charter trip. So obviously, the nearer you can take your anglers to some fish, the better. Finally, as someone who was there through the good times, your thoughts now on the decline of Fleetwood as the Northwest Premier Charter Angling Port. Fleetwood isn't a charter angling port anymore, is it really? If you've got one boat working out of it and, and when I was operating you could get up to 15, you might as well say it's finished. But the only thing good for the one charter boat that's left is there's only one and, and he only has to book 12 anglers a trip, not 10 boats looking for 12 anglers. So obviously if the amount of anglers have declined, he may still be able to fill up nicely because there's only the one boat to choose from. But as far as I'm concerned... Uh, 
I got out of it when everybody else got out of it, when it wasn't becoming viable. Everybody finished more or less over a period of a couple of years. It just died a death and, and has remained so since. I don't see it will improve very much, to be honest. A might more help from the council and better facilities have given it a better chance of longer-term survival. To an extent, yes, yes. I must admit we got no help off the council whatsoever. I did the Not End Ferry for a couple of years and I got no help from the council on that. So I do an extent blame the council. I mean, these charter fishing boats were fetching in hundreds and hundreds of people into Fleetwood every week, Saturday, Sundays, even midweek, and the council did nothing to accommodate these anglers. As far as engaging with the charter boats, getting aboard the charter boats, I mean, they had a ferry dock there that we did use for a couple of years while I did the ferry. The lads came in and used the ferry dock, which was much easier. But other than that, he was never allowed to use the ferry dock. So Fleetwood's charter industry demise was not through any lack of fish. Its fate at various levels lay within the control of others who chose not to help. That's true, yeah. I mean, it's like any charter trip, even dinghy trips. You can go on a trip and catch no fish, or you can go on a trip and catch plenty of fish. Uh, generally, he did get the fish, and at times there was some really good fishing. But um, due to the lack of anglers, basically, because uh, obviously there's not as many anglers today as there used to be, I mean, fishing was very popular. It still is popular, but it's not as popular as it was in the 80s or the 90s. And I can't see it ever will be that popular again. It's not due to the fish. I think the fish are still there to be caught. But can the anglers afford to pay for these charter boats these days? Have they become too expensive? I don't know. You could only command a certain price when I was charter fishing. To me, it was cheap for a day's fishing. I'm not sure what the prices are today, but uh, I'm sure that has something to do with it as well. Because these charter boats uh, don't cost pence to run. They cost thousands of pounds a year to run and buy. I mean, the price of a charter boat these days must be at least double the price I paid to build mine. So... In my day, fuel, I could get it for a pound a gallon. What does it cost now? Five pound a gallon. Things have gone up that much that uh, the charter boats have to charge enough to warrant running the boat, and that's probably too much for some anglers. Charter boat angling hasn't totally been lost to Fleetwood, and with the quality of fishing still available, nor should it be. The past three quarters of an hour or so merely reflects the period of change. My thanks then to Keith Philbin for filling in some of the detail with regard to the Lancashire coast and for reminding me of some very happy memories now unfortunately consigned to history. <laughs> <laughs>